más o menos. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, staying with us throughout the festival. It's Saturday. Um, after two or three days of drinking, I'm sure <laughs> we're very tired this morning. Um, my name is Jenny Choi. I'm from the News Integrity Initiative. Uh, we are a grant-making initiative and a global coalition uh, of uh, academics, journalists, uh, and um, researchers to build trust between newsrooms and communities. Uh, we are housed at the, at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, uh, and this panel is featuring one of our grant-making initiatives called Finding Common Ground, uh, which uh, the Agora Journalism Center out of the University of Oregon um, launched, which is a, um, uh, I think seven newsrooms were awarded uh, about 10,000 euros to experiment with community trust building projects. Uh, and basically this cohort started here in Perugia at the International Journalism Festival to share best practices. So um, everyone now is, uh, I think, very close, maybe closer than their own family and friends. <laughs> so. Um, I wanted to uh, briefly introduce, uh, so three of the seven projects um, will be featured uh, today. And I believe this is the last panel. Some of you may have seen other Finding Common Ground panels to introduce these projects. Um, but the whole point of sharing um, these stories is to not only um, brainstorm uh, best strategies to build trust and to incentivize your newsrooms to build trust with concrete and um, practical approaches, but also um, to show the business case. Um, we're talking a lot uh, these days about misinformation, um, how do you create revenue models for um, combating um, misinformation and uh, strengthening the brand of why the why journalists need to be trusted for a healthier discourse. Um, so uh, these three projects are very unique in the sense that they have um, begun in-person engagements as an outgrowth of their um, high quality journalism to build that trust um, and, and take it to the next step with uh, audiences and communities. The other interesting aspect of these projects is that there are very creative um, art forms. Um, bless you. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more um, about it in our conversation. And uh, we're trying to make this casual because this is a very intimate room. So if you have um, ideas or questions, please feel free um, to raise your hand or shout out, uh, do whatever uh, you need to do, That how the spirit moves you. Um, so the first, uh, our first presenter is Maeve uh, McClanahan. She is, um, let me get my notes up. She's an award-winning investigative journalist at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Maeve has previously produced investigations for BBC Radio, Guardian, BuzzFeed UK. Um, she'll talk about her uh, No Refuge tour, which is a very interesting um, theater project. Uh, Karolis, right here, Vishnoskis, is a journalist at Nanuk Multimedia, uh, which covers social and cultural issues. Uh, he founded Nyla, which is a podcast series under Nanook, and he's gonna talk a little bit about how he's um, incorporated the in-person live events um, out of his podcast. And finally, all the way at the end, um, is Greg Mono. He's an assistant professor of newspaper and online journalism at the Newhouse School of Syracuse University and the faculty director of The Stand, which is a community newspaper written for and by the residents of a diverse neighborhood in Syracuse, New York, known as the South Side. And he's gonna talk about a, an interesting photojournalism project called South Side Photo Walk. So without further ado, Maeve, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about your project. Sure. Your, award-winning and money-winning project. Mm -hmm. Sure, <laughs> thanks, what an introduction. <laughs> so, great. Um, so yes, thank you so much uh, for having me. So my name's Maeve, I work at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is a not-for-profit um, unit in the UK that does long-term investigations in the public interest and then gives them away, partners up with other established media organizations. And community engagement now forms uh, an integral part of what we do because a year ago, almost to the day, 
we launched a new project called Bureau Local. And the essence of that was, well, it was inspired by the fact that we believe local journalism is crucial in holding power to account. Um, but that more and more, especially in the UK, um, time pressures, funding pressures, mean that local journalists are, are really squeezed in what they can do. Um, some of, you know, my, my co colleague used to work at a local paper outside London, and he was being asked to write five stories a day. And if you're writing five stories a day, you just don't have time to do anything other than copying and pasting and maybe make a quick phone call. You can't do deep investigation. You can't hold power to account in the way you might want to as, a, as an investigative journalist. So we created the Bureau Local, which is kind of built on the model of the ICIJ, who do the Panama Papers and uh, Paradise Papers. The concept being that if we all work together in a collaborative um, engaged manner, we can be bigger than the sum of our parts and we can each break stories relevant to our local area that are scoops in themselves, but by doing a kind of fraction of the work because we've all put in together, which is kind of antithetical to the way investigative journalists often think. We want to break the story, we want to make sure we're not scooped, we certainly think that, you know, that, that we can go it alone. So it's, um, it was a bit of a risk, we didn't know if people were going to be into this, uh, but like I say, we're one year in. We have 680 members across the UK now. Um, many of those local journalists, some of those um, hyper-local bloggers, uh, concerned citizens, journalism students, people that just want to get involved and kind of dig into an investigation. And we've broken some, some really big stories that have both national and incredible local impact. And so I want to talk you through one of those today, which we are now um, planning, thanks to the Common Ground Fund, to develop in a kind of new community direction. And it's called uh, No Refuge. So the story started when this headline caught our attention back in January last year. And it was a story about Sunderland, which is a city in the north of England, um, where the council said they were going to cut funding for domestic violence refuges in the city. And all the refuge managers there said, well, then we simply are going to have to shut down. And that means um, women and children fleeing domestic violence are going to have nowhere to go in Sunderland. And we thought, if that's happening there, what's happening across the rest of the country? And funding in the UK for domestic violence refuges is council-based so 350 or so councils, each with different potential stories going on. No one had a clear idea of what was happening across the whole picture. And then at the same time, or rather a little later, once we'd been digging into it for a few months, um, a friend drew my attention to this Facebook post, um, which was a woman who was living in a refuge in Kensington and Chelsea, which is the richest borough in the UK. It's where Notting Hill is. Um, it's where, you know, all of the, uh, the prime ministers live and, and MPs live. Um, and amongst all of this wealth and luxury, she was staying in a refuge where there were rats, there were leaks. Um, they have been complaining for, for weeks and weeks about the state of the, the place. And then one night in July, the roof of the refuge fell in on them. And um, a lot of the women who had managed to just scrabble a few meager possessions uh, as they fled their homes um, found their things destroyed by rainwater tumbling through the roof. So I knew I wanted to talk to this woman. I knew I wanted to engage an entire community of, of our journalists to dig into what was happening in their regions. So we put a call out. Um, 20 journalists came on board. And we worked together for about three months. Um, we did a whole raft of Freedom of Information Act requests to all of those councils, and we shared that information with our local journalist network. We asked them to um, use a survey to go and talk to refuge managers, and they went and kind of did their own digging in their local area. And we all kind of fed back to each other what we were doing. And they, they produced some incredible stories. Here, the Yorkshire Post did a series of stories about what was happening in Yorkshire. Here in London, there's, there's more like really beautiful, deep features rather than just kind of cutting and pasting a, a press release, which we could have press released our, our findings. Instead, they had talked to people, uh, they had incredible case studies. Um, and because, this is the, the Lancashire Post who put it on their front page, because we had all of these individual local journalists working on their local stories, 
they each went to their local member of parliament and said, hey, I've heard this thing's happening in Hackney or I've heard this thing's happening in Leeds, what have you got to say about it? Which meant that then 12 MPs came out and called for change, whereas if I was just doing a national story, I would have just spoken to one person. So they produced 55 beautiful stories like that um, across the country, and we all published on one day. Um, after, since then, we've done about another 30 stories together on similar topics. We produce 17 national stories for TV, for press. We have all these MPs calling for change. There was a debate in Parliament because of it. The government opened a public consultation on how refugees should be funded two weeks after these stories came out. Um, and we basically revealed that, that funding had been cut by a quarter and that thousands of women were being turned away from refugees because there just wasn't the resources to support them. But along this route, I've been following the case of that woman from the Facebook post for three months as she was moved to different areas, to council flats where the walls were smeared with feces, to bed and breakfast where people could kind of come and go as they pleased, um, to you know, having kind of almost a nervous breakdown because of the stress of the events. Um, and we got to know each other quite well, and it turns out that she's an incredible writer. She wrote a beautiful first-person first piece for our website, um, and she's just an incredibly talented woman. And she was also doing stand-up comedy, which you wouldn't think you would do while you were also experiencing domestic violence, but she's a, a fighter. Um, and she is now, inspired by what happened to her, written a one-woman fictionalized show called The Refuge Woman, um, which is kind of about life in a refuge. And so we've decided to tour that show, thanks to the Common Ground funding, to eight of the cities where our local reporters did their investigations. And we're going to put on the show in small theatres or community centres or other spaces. We're going to invite the local politicians and councillors, the NGOs and refuge managers that, that work in this area and the real experts. She's going to do her show. Then our local journalist who worked in that area is going to stand up afterwards and say, that's a lovely fictionalised telling of it, but here's what's happening in Carlisle or here's what's happening in Birmingham. And then we'll have a debate with the local politicians and the refuge managers, and hopefully it's a creative safe space where we can kind of get this story to people in a different way. If they didn't read the paper that day, they happen to miss it, they can come and experience it in a completely different manner. So hopefully that's a, a whiz that's through great. what we're doing. Um, I'm actually going to follow up with a couple questions, if you don't mind. Um, I would love to hear the story of, um, well, first of all, how did um, your newsroom pivot to a local strategy? Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, what are some of the, her, I mean, how did you champion this work? Because I'm sure it wasn't something that your newsroom was used to engaging in. So right. um, I'm very interested in the back, the back story mm -hmm. of all the tears and fights that you have. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so our editor, Rachel, Ol Rachel Oldroyd, is, is something of a, a visionary in that the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in itself is quite an unusual model, um, this kind of independent unit that is, we're just allowed to run at stories for six months a year if, if they need them. Um, and I think she was really looking around. We've done things on, on drone strikes in the Middle East. Um, we've done things on, um, anti well, we're doing things on antibiotic resistance across the world. But she was surveying the kind of local, the UK side of things and what needs to happen next. And there has just been story after story about papers closing, about papers being whittled down to, you know, skeleton staff. And people are still doing incredible work. I want to say we're not... Um, we're not kind of replacing any of the system. What we decided to do was instead try and find a way to bolster what was already being done and give people that really, really want to do this kind of work an opportunity if they can, you know, some of these local journalists, they do it in their evenings because they're so desperate to kind of get these stories out, but they're trying to write five stories a day. Um, they'll do it in their evenings or, or people that will do it in their lunch break or they will show the kind of the, the stories that you can get to their editors and say, look, when we do investigative journalism, it really makes an impact. Um, so it kind of came from that, and it, like, quite literally inspired by the ICIJ model of if people can work together and we can collaborate, we can break something bigger. Um, and then quite fortunately, one of our um, advisors is a guy called Joaquin Alvarado, who is from, um, he was at the Center for Investigative Reporting in the US, and they had developed a, a project called StoryWorks, um, and they do Reveal, the podcast, which is an amazing podcast. And, and so they started to develop some of their actual journalism into 
um, theatrical works themselves. So I was kind of aware of that and I was bubbling away and then uh, Cash Carraway, um, who I got to know, said, I'm writing this play and a kind of light went on in my head where I said, oh, hang on, we know that they do that and we know that we like what they do. So actually it wasn't as hard a battle as you would <laughs> imagine in the, in the office. They were quite up for it. And um, just one more follow-up question. In terms of, um, I, I love that you frame collaboration to address infrastructural capacity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find that um, I hear a lot of newsrooms saying that they don't want collaboration because it takes too much effort. Um, so what are some key uh, takeaways in terms of um, advice that you can give for people who are kind of dipping into that? Yeah, I mean, it does take effort. We, the Bureau local team are five people now, and one of them, a relatively new role, is specifically a community organizer, because we realize with 680 local journalists in our network, we need somebody whose job is literally to check in with them and make sure that they have what they need and, and listen to, to their requests. Um, so it does take work, but I would say those five of us that are those journalists, we've produced, I think, 200 local stories and probably 50 more national stories in this year. Um, the, the, the five of us working alone couldn't have done all that. So in terms of, you know, return on your investment, I would say, yeah, it's, it's about that. It's about kind of long-term thinking um, and then creating structures by which you kind of have things like we use Slack just to talk mm. to each other. We use bulletins. We try and do face-to-face um, -face kind of hack days and events where we can actually meet people and, and get to know them. So it's about kind of thinking creatively nice. that way. Oh, girl. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, next is um, Carolis, who's already kind of um, dipped his toe in uh, the live um, in-person event space. So, um, Carolis, take it away. Are you going to sing first? <laughs> that would be good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like to hear it. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, Maeve, it's, it's really exciting project that you're doing, and I'm happy that we at Common Ground can know each other now, now the journalists participating in it. So uh, now I want to take you to Lithuania, a country in the uh, Baltic states in uh, Europe. And uh, here we uh, are a multimedia agency called Nanook. And I will give you some background so then you will see where we are coming from. Because Lithuanian media landscape is it's a small country. It's uh, less than 3 million uh, residents. And uh, so there are few major media institutions in the country. But none of us um, really liked any of those. And we decided that instead of being just freelancers, we would rather unite together and uh, create something something that we would like to, uh, that we want from journalism. So we want social conscious journalism, we want journalism with strong uh, visual um, storytelling and uh, like uh, um, long form storytelling in general. So first projects by Nanook were um, a project called Monotone Days that uh, talked about station in a uh, women's prison in Lithuania. It was made, made by my colleague Berta Tilmantaita, she's here with us, so um, I'm happy that she's here. Um, Another project was about Lithuanian Paralympian team. Um, now we just launched a project uh, about Russian refugees living in Lithuania because there are, apparently there are a lot of people who basically cannot live in today's Russia because of their political views. And Lithuania is a country that can provide shelter to them. And this is kind of an unknown story even in our own country. So we just revealed it and, and published now. Um, I previously worked uh, in the national radio. And I always loved podcasts. I just love the format, and I still I still do it. And all journalists now, a team, we really listen to mostly American um, podcast shows, like uh, produced by NPR and other other um, uh, news providers. So we thought, why don't we do it in Lithuanian language? And um, we launched our first professional podcast in Lithuania. It's called Nyla. I, th I feel like I also have to explain the name here because it can be strange for people um, coming from, like, let's say, Northern America just to see that we are in the Baltics have a name Nanook, and Nyla is also not, uh, uh, which is, has this Northern um, feel to it. Um, so basically, we just want to give a respect to the film Nanook of the North, um, which was the first documentary film 
even though it was quite fictional in terms of history, but still. So we want to provide a new kind of documentary journalism in Lithuania. So we thought we'll take the name. Also, we like how it sounds. And yeah, and, uh, yeah so that's maybe the, the right reason. Yeah, so every Tuesday we produce a new episode. Uh, mostly we focus on culture and social issues. It's a broad variety of topics. For example, here's the picture uh, when we did a story on um, Roma people living in Lithuania, because um, they are the most stigmatized community in the country, even though they've been living there for a lot of years. So we talk with a new generation of Roma people in Lithuania, how did, and, and wanted to find out how did, do they see their future? Um, do they want to stay in the country? If not, what will they do? Um, this is a um, picture from episode where we did a story on Muslims living in Lith Lithuania. It's also a small community, but they get a lot of st stigmatization from events that can happen in other countries, even though the Lithuanian Muslims has nothing uh, have nothing to do with them. Hold on, yeah. uh, Carolus, I love this photo. How did you get this family to? invite you inside their home because look at you are very different from them so i'm just curious we are yes uh, <laughs> yeah so this is a syrian a syrian family living in konas the next biggest city in uh, lithuania basically um we just got our colleagues from red cross in lithuania they made they they, they kind of introduced us to each other and because other journalists in the nook team they already had a good reputation like when I joined them, I was really proud of myself as a journalist to be in this team. So since um, people themselves don't really trust mainstream media in Lithuania, so when we see that we're doing something independent, they kind of give us credit. And our role then is not to, not to spoil that trust. So we hope that we did. So yeah, we just spent time with them and uh, with their, their young family trying to uh, make their home in Lithuania. Yeah, and one more story uh, uh, that I want to share is about um, uh, a sexual harassment case. Basically, with, the, um, uh, with our podcast, we managed to break the first Me Too story in Lithuania. We got uh, one art director l working with the most famous Lithuanian film director um, and she, uh, to, t to tell the, her story about... Uh, how she w was harassed by him, and then was another actress who also gave an inclusive interview for us. So basically we published their stories as a podcast episode, and they also trusted us instead of, instead of mainstream media, um, uh, because they knew that we won't kind of Make their st they present their stories in the in the right in the right way, and that story went international. Like Hollywood Reporter covered it, um, French media covered it because that director is famous in France. So then we we felt like we can actually even being in from a small country and a really just small collective of people can do big things. And uh, uh, how do we fund it? I want to say that community building is not about the mm, people that we interview and share their stories. We also want to build community in terms of, um, in terms of our listeners, uh, because um, we launched we launched a Patreon campaign. Didn't really expect anything, and now since September we have like 100. 80 paid patrons now, and with more than $1,000 per month to do our job. Of course, it's not enough. We need private sponsors, we need NGO partners, we need funds like Common Ground Fund, but uh, we're really happy that it, it is actually happening because the new generation of like Lithuanian readers, they, they weren't used to the idea of paying for content at all. And our re reader, our listeners are mostly like people our age. We did one, um, one episode where we were interviewing them, so here are some pictures of them. Yes, and now I want to move to our newest project. It's, it's called Nyla Life, and here's some context for that. Uh, Lithuania is a country that hasn't really, doesn't really have a um, history in um, debating, like in, in public debates, because it, if you go to the, if you look at the Soviet history of Lithuania, all the political debates, they were happening like in the kitchen privately, but not in a public spaces. And now we see that we don't have this culture. And when Facebook um, started in the world, in Lithuania, it got so huge. Like everyone is on Facebook in Lithuania, even like my grandfather is in Lithuania and using it, it, it on Facebook yeah, and is using it because people s needed a place where they can debate things. But the problem with Facebook is that instead of actually going for solutions, you just go to your local like 
tribes and 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 uh, and you don't really reach uh, you, you just, you, the society is really divided in, in the sense, and we thought that no, even though we produce content on the internet, it's not, we, we must go one step further and present it in, and actually meet each other with, with live, uh, live events. We were inspired by Guardian live events that they did this, uh, a lot of like panels on uh, big interesting topics where they invite people and they would invite the audience to ask questions as well. So we did the first um, uh, event in Vilnius University. It was connected with Lithuania uh, uh, as a country celebration of one, 100 years of Lithuania's independence. But um, there were a lot of like really cheerful events in the country and of course it's a big event and we are we are happy about it as well but there's a lot of history from that time that was untold and one thing that got really curious for us is um about women's uh, movement in Lithuania 100 years ago, because Lithuania was one of the first countries in Europe that women got a right to vote. But when you look at the history of a country, in, in terms of how many politicians, how many influential intellectuals were women, this, the number just went down, and we, we wanted to find out what happened. So we did debate on that, uh, um, and yeah, it was, I think it was quite successful. We wanted just to pre present a different kind of culture of talking in Lithuania. And uh, and we, we recorded the event and we published it as a podcast. So with the help of Common Ground, we want to continue that. We want to continue that this year and the next year. And there's a lot of topics to discuss in Lithuanian society because a lot of conversations that are happening in the Western world are, are already solved, are still the issues in Lithuanian society. For example, now, again, we have some politicians and now uh, quite... Um, Unfortunately, there are quite a um, big amount of them who want to deny it, uh, women's right to abortion, or for example, um, uh, there's a lot of social and income inequality in Lithuania after joining the European Union and after the Euro. Um, uh, also, there's a lot of strict, for example, drugs policy. You can actually you can get caught smoking weed, and and you can actually get go to jail for that, which is just it just uh, it shouldn't be like this when you look at the other countries. But the laws must change. But the debate is only on internet, and we and, and people don't meet each other. So we want to want to talk that. We want to talk about mental health. We want to talk about LGBT rights. But the the important thing is just to look each other in the eyes and do that. So we want to provide the space uh, for that. We just started, uh, but uh, yeah, so far we had only one event, but we want to make it a continuous place where people know that, okay, we have to gather there, we, um, we talk to each other, and the podcast is a way to bring that conversation to those who cannot participate, to those who are not living in Lithuania. There are almost one million Lithuanians who are not living in Lithuania. They don't want to lose a connection of what ha what's happening. Uh, they want, don't want to forget the language and don't want to forget the issues that are there. So um, we believe that we want to provide that and we believe that that's the mission of journalism. So yeah, uh, thank you. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, Carlos, um, you talked a little bit, and I'm going to pivot to Maeve. Greg, can you um, uh, maneuver from there? Or do you? No, we need to show for you. Awesome. Um, so, you talked a little bit about creating safe spaces for talking, for people to talk um, yeah. to each other eye to eye, and that's very. And I'm going to actually ask Maeve to weigh in on this as well. Creating safe spaces, um, because maybe you mentioned this, is very um, volatile. Um, when we talk about trauma. And both of your projects, I feel like, um, uh, have dealt with um, sources or um, folks who've um, experienced intense trauma. So creating safe spaces um, seems like a very daunting thing to do um, from a newsroom perspective. So um, let's start with you, Carolas. Um, what does that mean, creating safe space by talking? Do you need additional training to make sure that your trauma survivors are also safe? Um, basically, you learn it by doing. Of course, that's maybe not the not the best not the best approach. You, you I, I mean, I read before doing a story on on, on sexual harassment. I did a lot of um, research of how 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 do you actually do that? Because especially if I'm a, um, because I I also we worked as a team, but I also interviewed some of the. Um, uh, some of our sources who are women, and I thought, like, is that maybe that's a problem that I'm doing that? But uh, so I did my research on how you do that, uh, and 
and then you just try to be as professional, as ethical as you are. So um, we don't really have much experience in that in Lithuania, but, and I guess in a lot of countries as well, but uh, you just have to do your best, I think. And uh, also one more thing, it's, yeah, it's about creating safe spaces, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to invite people who have opposing views. Mm -hmm. That's one of the yeah, finding uh, uh, solution that you have to invite people who, who, are, who think differently. It's just that we want to have a decent conversation instead of, instead of uh, people like cursing at each other. But that is also, there's a lot of hate speech on like Lithuania and internet. We just want to move away from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maeve? Um, so we gave a lot of guidance to our community of journalists when they were doing this story um, as to ways to protect their sources, um, things like making sure there wasn't any metadata in photos that they used of, of locations, um, things about obviously changing names even when people said it's probably fine to use my name to be hyper safe on, on that kind of things and taking out identifying details. Um, but with the events themselves, uh, we're exploring the idea of um, taking the talk actually into refuge spaces itself. Um, whether that's appropriate in different situations, we're, we're yet to see, but that could be, uh, I think, one really strong way that um, women who are currently in danger could still kind of engage and, and uh, take part in that. And then in the theatre and the community spaces, I think it's about framing right from the start the kind of space and that you want. So because this is a kind of theatrical event with a talk on the end and then an opening up, um, it's less framed as a debate about come and you know argue the, the, the toss about this thing. It's, it's more about like this is an opportunity to hear points of view and to um, share your experience if you feel comfortable doing that. Fascinating. Okay, last but not least, our American friend, Greg, <laughs> from New York. Are you ready? Thank you, everybody. Yes, good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to present um, the Stan Newspaper's South Side Photo Walk to you. It's in many ways a very simple project, maybe the simplest one among the Common Fund grantees. Um, but I think it has a lot of power and is also probably relatively easily reproducible elsewhere. Um, the Stan Newspaper um, let me use this. Uh, covers a community in Syracuse um, that doesn't get positive press coverage. It's only in the news when something goes wrong. And um, the residents really feel um, cheated by that, that um, their community has been given this black eye, when in fact crime is very widely distributed in the Syracuse area. Um, it's a nice city. I don't want to give people the impression that it's not. But by some measures, it's one of the um, poorest cities in America. And um, on this one particular census measure that measures concentrations of poverty and in relation to um, the neighborhoods adjacent to the poor neighborhoods, it's, uh, as, it's as segregated a city uh, by class as uh, we have in the country. So recognizing this, my mentor, Steve Davis, started a newspaper specifically to cover the stand, uh, to cover this uh, community called The Stand in 2010, and um, hired a, a really brilliant woman named Ashley Kang um, to kind of run its day-to-day -day operations. And she's very much kind of of this community, and that's been a huge asset in making everything that The Stand has done successful. Um, so, uh, we brought community members up to the Newhouse School. Um, the Newhouse is kind of up on the hill with a very kind of white, affluent student body. Uh, the South Side is kind of down in the valley, and um, we wanted to break those barriers um, and build some common ground with the uh, community there. So, um, the, uh, the, the white guy in the background is Steve Davis, who's founded the newspaper, and he's training community members here to cover their own community, to be community correspondents. And um, it leads to stories that um, traditional newspapers probably would not cover. Um, if you see this guy out on the corner, you might wonder what he's doing with a bunch of knives and a toy gun, and it seems kind of menacing and threatening, but he's actually... Um, uh, encouraging people to turn in their weapons to him. And at the end of every day, he takes them to the police department where they're destroyed. Um, and why this story was being told, why, while he was being interviewed, a couple of people came up and turned in knives to him, uh, which you can kind of see on the sidewalk there. Um, that story would never appear in uh, the mainstream newspaper in Syracuse. 
Um, so um, training people to tell stories in a written form is, is quite difficult. Um, and we were also looking for ways to demystify the neighborhood for people outside of the community. It was one of the things we heard from Southside residents was that the stand was wonderful in terms of kind of making them feel better about themselves, giving them a place where they can see themselves reflected in newsprint. It also has a digital component, but it was important to us that we had a printed free product to distribute as well. And um, so we came up with this idea of a photo walk, um, which is not an original idea. In fact, I think the first couple of years we might have piggybacked on a national event. Um, but it ended up being a really um, effective mechanism for getting people that would never come into this community to come into this community. In many ways, it's a beautiful place. There's really old architecture. Um, it has a lot of charms, but people just have this unnatural fear of it. Um, and But as, as part of a group, um, being escorted by people who are from the community who obviously also take part in this, um, we were able to break some of those barriers down. And it really becomes a, a joyous uh, occasion. People get silly and, and have, a lot of, have a lot of fun with it. I'm going to see if I can play this short video uh, where I think will give you an idea of what I mean. So there's some, oh, oh there it is. become an uh, opportunity for people to get creative, to get silly, to explore a place where they haven't explored before, to meet people that they've never uh, met before. And crucially, those, those interactions are going both ways um, at this event. And um, the photos are really quite striking. And, um, and people, they're not used to media attention. And they, they want it. They're, um, you know, we give people training that if people don't want their photo taken, this is not a hardcore journalistic exercise where we're going to shove a camera in someone's face if they don't want it in their face. Um, but we, um, uh, most people are, are very happy to be photographed as, as part of this. And I, I think it's because they see community members as part of our group. I think that helps a lot. Um, and, and again, I, they, 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 they're not used to seeing people that have any interest in them whatsoever. Um, so it makes for amazing content. Uh, it helps build neighborhood identity and pride. And um, uh, we're able to distribute these in images even more broadly than we normally would with the stand. And of course, it makes great content for us. Filling the stand with content is always a challenge every month. And so I'll just flip through some of the pages that we've been able to produce over the years as a result of this project. So one of the things we've done um, is build a relationship with um, Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa. Um, uh, Grahamstown, as it turns out, is not that much different than Syracuse. It's got a university up on a hill um, with a pretty good journalism program, and it's got a poor population that lives down at the bottom of the hill. And, um, and so we've been able, or we're going to be using the Common Fund grant to start a photo walk in Grahamstown on the same day as we do ours in Syracuse. We've already started swapping content with a newspaper in Grahamstown called Grocott's Mail. So we had some students go there over uh, Christmas break and um, write profiles of people in that community. and. Um, that content ran in the stand, that content ran in Grocott's Mail. We've started each month swapping at least one story with them that we think is appropriate. And we're really looking forward to having this kind of um, parallel photo walks with uh, Grahamstown to further build that relationship. Another thing that we'll be using the grant money for is to get more um, cameras, more loaner cameras. Um, 
amateur photography is huge in, in, in the United States right now. Um, and so a lot of people come with their own equipment that's pretty sophisticated. Uh, but of course, we always have people that don't have the equipment and we want to be able to have them participate as well. So we have some cameras that we bought in year one of this project, but they're pretty much nearing the end of their lives and uh, need to replace those. Um, we also hire a photo, tr a professional photographer from the community to give people, you know, quick half hour training on how to frame a good shot. And um, as I think you saw, the photos turn out pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, the stand does other things as well, um, it, it, particularly in conjunction with our university student journalists. Uh, we did an in-depth piece on community relations with the police department called They Wear Blue. We looked at fair and unfair housing practices in um, our area called My Housing Matters. Um, and we've got a really interesting project going on right now where we're focusing on fathers in the Southside community, and that's that last series of photos. So that's the stand Southside Photo Walk. Thank you. So um, Greg, uh, I'm originally from Chicago, so your project resonates um, with me um, very much so. Um, I wanted to highlight, you kind of touched upon this in your presentation, but I really wanted to uplift this notion of race um, because in uh, the States, um, the topic of race and the racialization of, you know, this toxic discourse in Carolas, you talked a little bit about hate speech, for example, um, but institutionally and systemically, race has been a huge um, undercurrent of the segregation of communities. Um, so I'm just curious, you said the white guy, Steve, in a pre predominantly <laughs> black neighborhood. Um, how do you get into those spaces? I mean, what's the secret to not exploiting the folks that you are trying to build these relationships with? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, his, I think, first stroke of genius was hiring Ashley, um, who, um, uh, is accepted as a, as a community member, and I think that helped a lot. And, um, and just his general um, guiding principle was that he wanted the, the stand to be of, by, and for the South Side, that he was not gonna, he's a pretty serious guy, and, but he did not want to impose his kind of sensibility onto the stand. I mean, he wants to make sure that the copy's clean and all that stuff, and we do have some quality control, but um, he started off very flexible in a listening kind of stance and um, pretty quickly established a community board of advisors um, who are still involved um, and um, go on some of the trips. Like when we went to Grahamstown, I, I didn't go, but when Steve uh, took his group over Christmas break, we had two of the community board members. Um, and we also, there's a, a, a high school in that neighborhood called Fowler High School, and we got an administrator from the high school and some of the students from the school to come. Uh, so it wasn't just for the Newhouse students, it was also for people on the community to go explore, uh, have this fake, you know, trip of a lifetime kind of situation. So that's, that's helped a lot. So one of so one of the co-founders and project um, leads being a resident actual of the actual community, um, and then having uh, a formal council where residents have power to give input and influence. Because I often hear this tension between quality control mm -hmm. um, and the residents that you're uh, working with, right? And so quality control, um, who defines it? How is it defined? Who makes the decision? who has power, that's always kind of a, a tense um, role to navigate. Yeah, you know, so we'll do, um, the editing class that I teach does some of the copy editing and stuff like that. So we'll check links, uh, we'll check the spellings of proper names, um, we'll, you know, change times and dates into AP style mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, we're, but outside of that, we're very hands-off. Um, and um, we, we want it to sound like the South Side, and, and so we don't want to edit that out of the copy. Um, and I just think, you know, when Steve came in there, he's like, you know, I'm not the expert on the South Side, you're the expert on the South Side. And I, I, I think that was really empowering to the people to even hear that. I think they're used to being talked down to. I think they're, they're, they're used to having people tell them how to fix their neighborhood um, or having misguided initiatives kind of just come crashing in. 
and um, uh, and in this case, it was really just uh, a process of soliciting uh, input from the community itself. Wonderful, and um, just one more follow-up question. Um, in Chicago, oftentimes, um, so the local journalism ecosystem is struggling um, in a lot of for a lot of dumb reasons. But um, one of the reason, one of the ways in which we were trying to um, inform. Um, our communities around the public service ne necessity of what journalism, the role that journalism plays, is to highlight the disinvestment in these communities that often get overlooked. Yeah. Um, and then once you tell those stories, um, then business owners, businesses, and local officials began to see the opportunities of what reinvesting in those communities would look like. So I'm just curious if the stand has seen any traction um, around that at all. I, that's a great question. I, uh, I remember seeing a piece maybe last year in the Los Angeles Times that looked at even things like trash pickup and um, they correlated it with the income of different neighborhoods and found that pickup times were being missed in the poorer neighborhoods significantly more often than in the wealthier neighborhoods. And I am sure there are similar patterns, whether it's fixing potholes or investing in the schools or whatever, that the, um, that neighborhood, those constituents are not getting the attention they deserved. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a project we've done uh, to date that really touches on that, but I would love to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Maeve, Carlos, did you want to jump in on any of these questions that I just asked? Great. <laughs> That's all good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, can, I can just add that um, race relations, for example, in a country like uh, Lithuania, where uh, you don't really have much, well, the diversity is more like on ethnic level. You have people from uh, yeah. Polish communities from Russian communities, but in terms of uh, race, there's not much diversity. But still, for, uh, actually, last week we did one episode um, where we talked with a uh, w uh, with a, a dance teacher who came from. Um, he was living in France for a long time, and and uh, he's, he teach, he's been teaching urban dance classes for the last ten years in Lithuania, and we were talking about how the. Uh, hip hop culture and like black culture in general was kind of appropriated by Lithuanians in this kind of strange sense because there were no history of that. So we are interested in like these cul cultural um, issues. For, ex for example, what it means to see a film like uh, Black Panther being Lithuanian, how do you understand that? So we raised these questions in our podcast and we wouldn't be able to raise those questions in like mainstream media because they would think like who would be interested in that so we go to these like niche topics that are interest that are going in west that the conversation that are happening in western countries we want to bring them to Lithuania so race is one of those questions that are interesting for us but of course the whole dynamics is completely different than in the US. Hmm. Interesting. So all three of you have, um, and I'll uh, open it up to the room for more questions, but all three of you, um, there are two very um, interesting, um, I think, elements that maybe you undersell yourselves on is that all three of you um, exhibited a lot of bravery um, in the work that you're doing, um, and you're probably not thinking so much about it as you're trying these new things. Um, but I'm curious um, if you can think of when you were afraid and how you pushed through that for some of these experiments and um, talking to um, new audiences and engaging them. And the second um, theme, and so I'd love for all three of you to speak to that, um, pushing through fear um, and self-doubt in some of this work. And the second part of it is, um, you know, Carlos, you were talking about um, giving audiences who are typically ignored, um, feeling, uh, giving them care, right? Um, audiences that are diverse but um, typically don't um, feel value from mainstream media. And I feel like Maeve um, with the domestic violence survivors and Greg from uh, the South Side. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about the audience opportunities that, you know, folks that you're covering as folks that were welcoming, even though it seemed intimidating because they were so different from you, to welcome you and also as potential audiences, as Carolus, you've already seen to invest in um, your efforts. So, Greg, did you want to um, start off? Sure. Um, what was the first part of the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> Bravery, like when you <laughs> Bravery, were Bravery, yes, weird. yes, yes. So, I mean, 
it, Ashley's really the one that kind of stuck her neck, neck out in the community and Steve to get this started. But I worked on a, a previous engagement pro project when I was at the Syracuse Daily called Central New York Speaks. And being an event planner is terrifying. Um, you, you go through all this effort to set up the event and one second you're panicked that no one's gonna come. The next second you're panicked that everybody's gonna come, you're not gonna have enough coffee, you're not gonna have enough cookies. <laughs> and I know that Ashley feels that anxiety with the photo walk. And as you could see from the photos, like we've been incredibly lucky with weather. Um, <laughs> each photo walk, I mean, we'll, one day it will pour during our photo walk and We'll deal with that challenge when it comes, but the, the, the stress is palpable every year about will, I, will anybody come, will everybody come, are we going to have enough cameras, and um, you just do the best you can, hope for the best, tell yourself that it's better to try than not to do it at all, uh, and, and then go, for, go from there. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, it turns out booking a theatre tour is quite hard and not <laughs> part of my job description and not something I have any experience in. So um, that's, that's going to be interesting. Um, I think with this project particularly, uh, in the past the Bureau of Locals done things where we have spent a long time building up the story, we know what it is, we've scraped or found some data, we've cleaned it up, and then we produce a really... Um, you know, constructed, well-constructed reporting recipe and we pass that out to the local journalists and they can kind of dig in and find their own things. With this project, it was very different. We got them on board really early and at that stage, I didn't actually know if I had a story for them or not. I was saying to 20 journalists, um, I think there's something here, I'm hearing this stuff here, I'm gonna do all this stuff, but I really need your help to come on board too. And it could have been that there wasn't a story and I'd wasted a load of people's time, but... Um, so yeah, there's moments of kind of self-doubt, but I think you have to trust in your journalistic instincts and then trust in people that they will do the work if they are engaged enough and trust them that they won't just run and print the story and, and scoop all of us if we give them kind of first sight of information weeks or months in advance that they will uh, hold, hold fast and, and publish as a team. Um, yeah. Um in terms of bravery, I don't know. Um, I was thinking a lot that maybe one of the fears that I want to I've share, want to share maybe did, it, this doesn't go directly to your to your question, but I think that this is important. That at at one point it's like you you have to, you feel like you are bra not a brave, but journalists doing important things when you go to uh, communities that that are unrepresented in uh, in usual media. But at, uh, but at the same time you feel like you are you don't want to exploit them, like, oh, now I went to Muslim family, now I went to Roma family, now I will talk about race and, and like, what's the next marginalized group in society for me to kind of uh, be a part of that and then just leave it and move to some other things. So that is one of the fears. And you know that uh, you kind of, when you put those people in the spotlight, you know that when you, uh, there's a lot of, again, people on the internet who would be saying like, um, is it really like, is it really a topic that you're doing? Is it, is it um, like uh, maybe, maybe you're just trying to see problems where they actually there aren't. That's one of the mm, like reactions that sometimes we get from people. So, which is just, uh, isn't really inspiring, but we get much more, more in inspiring uh, reactions and that really keeps keeps us going. But this thing that you go to, you meet meet people and then you leave them and you and you feel you there's this feeling of exploitation a bit and we want to escape it, but it's always there. So, yeah, I I think that's an important part. So how do you hold on to that relationship so that um, the folks that you have touched and have gotten to know um, continue to engage whether or not, whether they inform your content, um, but also invest in your content um, eventually? So we, the, our live events are one of those, um, one of those ideas to continue the conversation. Like, okay, we did a podcast episode on one topic. People heard those people talking for, uh, on their earphones, right? But now we want to make an opportunity to see them live and re ask questions and just continue the conversation. So, um, uh, yeah, that's one of the ways to 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 create a new platform for for that. That's that's what we want to do. Maeve or Greg, um, have you thought uh, about um, continuing to build those relationships and sustain those relationships, even though you're on to the next thing? Yeah, um, for us, I mean, 
yes, so, so we're continuing to build relationships with the journalists. The, the kind of beauty of the Bureau Local pro Project is all of those people are much better placed to keep having those discussions with their community members than, than we are. So we're doing this element of, of kind of taking things to them, but many of them did follow-up stories on different elements specific to their regions that we wouldn't have found the kind of uh, national picture for. So yeah, it's kind of opened doors um, for some of those journalists to, to keep reporting on things, which is really good. Yeah, so some of our feature stories, uh, the subjects of those feature stories turned into writers for The Stand. They, you know, they kind of knew about The Stand, maybe they picked it up, but they weren't really invested in it, and then boom, there they are in it, and um, they love it, and they, they, you know, they were interviewed by one of their neighbors because um, we have community correspondence, and so they immediately get the idea that they can do this too, and they can, um, and so... Um, one of the ways we recruit uh, correspondents is um, by um, just writing about the community and those people turn into supporters and um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't ever ask for money from the community. Although it's an ongoing debate whether, uh, it was originally envisioned that the stand would somehow become self-supporting um, and that the university would back away from it. And, now I don't even know if we necessarily think that's desirable. It's a great outlet for our students, and um, if there's anybody that has the money in Syracuse to invest in a project like this, it's the university. So, oh, wow. yeah. interesting. So um, we'd love to. Well, first of all, I wanted to. Well, no, I won't do that. <laughs> um, I wanted to open um, the open it up to the room if anyone had any questions or comments. Um, I don't know if there's a microphone, but it's a small room, so you can project. Anyone? Ferris? <laughs> oh. Um, I was to what I was oh, I the guess we have a mic. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, so I was going to ask you because what you were saying was about not letting the students come in with um, Okay. It, I, don't, I don't know if it's on. Um, can you hear? I can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> yeah. We can hear you. Um, I was just wondering if. Um, oh, sorry. I was just wondering if. Um, you're interested in um, verbatim theatre as a way of kind of incorporating journalism and a community at the same time, or if that wouldn't really be in the bureau's remit? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really interesting as a concept. I'm not sure that it, it, the bureau is so limited. Like, we're a team of, I think, about 15 total, and five of us are on this bureau local project. Um, I think it, it works in this sense because this woman was already doing her piece, I'm not sure I could have gone to her and said, hey, write me a play <laughs> um, while you're at it. But I do think that there's incredible power in, like, I, I'm a huge fan of theatre myself, um, and I think there's incredible power in telling stories in that way, and getting those stories out to people that might not read their papers or watch the TV, people who might not trust news as a form of, um, you know, as a form of uh, engaging in debate or information. Um, or yeah, just different ways of, you know, getting a point across that's much more emotive and, and kind of visceral than a list of statistics and facts. So I would love to see more of that. And I think what StoryWorks in the US are doing is really cool. They do stuff like they take it to the communities in the way we're trying to do. Um, yeah, the more of that, the better. But, and I would love the Bureau to be involved with that, but it would be a hard sell, mm -hmm. I think, to the editors to say, let me do that as well as trying to do an investigation. Um, actually, on that, as far as um, selling, all right, I'm, I'm killing time for you guys to brainstorm questions. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the prevalent concern that I'm always hearing with community building strategies, especially with in-person, is we don't have time, we don't have resources. So how do you respond to that concern? You know, it, you know it, something like the photo walk is probably as cheap a way as you can get brilliant content for your newspapers I can think of. And it's really, um, it just requires a different mindset, I think, more than, 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 than funding. And, um, you know, the cameras, and there's some costs there. And my, the daily in Syracuse that I worked for would, would never lend out its equipment to people. But, um, but it could, right? And, and in, in a way, it would be... Um, you, you, you can't buy this kind of content, I don't think. So um, I, I think that 
whatever their concerns are that would keep them from doing something like this, whatever their concerns are that um, made it necessary that somebody else in the community step up and do something like this, um, I think are really largely unfounded. Yeah, maybe you could frame it as, you know, every time I go and, and talk to a source or do an interview, they always have 12 ideas for what else I should be looking at and who else I should be talking to. So if you could frame it like that, you know, the more people we talk to, you get more ideas for stories, the better. But also we do stuff like um, we hold hack days where we get everyone together in one room uh, across cities in the UK to dig into one bit of research. And that's just time consuming and that it takes a long time to get to organize those and to book the rooms and to get the, re the data ready. But then you get, uh, you know, 160 people we had at one time all digging into the same thing, finding different stories. And if you had 160 people coming to you individually and asking you questions, that would take six months. So it's... It's kind of, it pays off in that sense. Oh, I got you, girl. <laughs> All right. Um, Carlos, did you want to answer and then we'll... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I'll just quickly add that in our case, uh, community building is connected with the uh, development of the whole uh, podcast and the whole Nanook platform. For example, if we are hosting a live event, we have a new podcast episode after that event. So it, it's new content for us. Or for example, if you want to engage with our listeners, uh, through Patreon campaign, um, we also that will in the end that will bring us more uh, pat patron sponsors, and we will get give more money to make our content. So um, it is it is also has this like financial value. But of course, well, I'm not saying that we want to build community to get more money. That's of course that's not what I'm saying. But I'm but I'm saying that it's it, it, community building goes together with the building of uh, of our podcast. It just goes hand in hand. I can tell you're a menacing mogul. So <laughs> thank you for explaining. Um, yes. Hi, Krina Boras from Open Democracy and Investigate Europe. A question, a very good question for Maeve. You said you have over 600 members. Mm -hmm. How do you keep in touch with them? How do you engage with them? How do you get them together? I mean, yeah. it must have been quite a master puppeteer type of job. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, yes, it grew, it kind of grew exponentially over that first, we've only been going a year. Um, and we, so we have a mailing list. We just do bulletins and call outs. So if we have a specific project that we know, uh, do you want to come aboard this thing we're doing on council taxes or on Facebook and elections, whatever it might be, we do that call out. We have a Slack group um, and we have a general kind of chat page on that. But then if we have a specific investigation, we have private channels and we ask people, we kind of onboard people and ask them to sign up to a series of principles around that so that they know that they can trust everyone in that channel. Um, we're still exploring whether Slack is the right platform because not everybody uses Slack. I hadn't used it before this. Um, we try to do as many face-to-face -face meetings as we can. So we've held two, two big hack days, which each involved going to simultaneously having events in five cities um, involving scores and scores of people. Um, and we want to do more of those. But yeah, it's a big effort to 680 people. Some of them are more engaged than others. Um, we're looking at ways to try and deepen some of those um, relationships rather than expanding further. Um, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, it's funny, this is my first festival and um, I'm seeing how the panels are back to back so I promise that when I was moderating I'd leave some time for networking so that we don't get kicked out or um, beaten up. Um, oh, <laughs> maybe I spoke right too soon. <laughs> but I, I wanted um, each of you to um, maybe give us one piece of advice um, to move forward on uh, past some of the fears that you were able to push through. And also maybe one kind of observation in your experience um, with the Finding Common Ground cohort and maybe that before uh, Perugia you felt a little bit alone, but maybe um, I'm just curious um, your experience uh, spending um, a couple of days now with your fellow colleagues across the world. Well, I mean, it's, it's the support that uh, Finding Common Ground has given us is, is really tremendous, and thank you to the News Integrity Initiative for that, and um, um, the I Bosch Foundation. Bosch. Yeah, yeah Bosch Foundation for sure, and University of Oregon. So, I mean, you know, I, I think there's a growing recognition that the commercial um, model is is 
has some serious problems. And the fact that these uh, foundations are stepping up is, is really huge. So if you have a project idea that you think is worthy of, of funding, um, you know, we were kind of surprised. Again, I think the South Side Photo Walk is a very simple project. It's, it's not the first time it was done, but they saw that it was having impact and they, and they funded it. And um, that encourages us to reach out to other foundations and more funding and try to grow this even bigger and try to do some more serious um, investigations like I think Jenny was suggesting um, in terms of distribution of resources on the South Side. I guess I would say for advice, um, to think of this as, you know, all journalists, we're all talking to sources all the time, we're all trying to tell stories all the time. This is just a new way of thinking about doing that. Um, and in a media landscape where it seems like people judge the worth of a story and how many clicks it gets, this is a way to just kind of reinterpret what it means to get your story out there and to be heard by the right people and to be hearing from the right people and people that you might not immediately go to on the end of a phone call but that you kind of come across in day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think just being part of this cohort um, has been great because community engagement can be a quite a nebulous concept, quite kind of, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what it meant. And just hearing specific examples like this, you know, I'm thinking we could do a photo walk around yeah. Islington. That would be really interesting. Or we could be doing these kind of, uh, you know, common space events and, and doing a podcast after it. It's just really good to get inspired with kind of tangible, practical examples that I'm now going to steal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, for me, this Common Ground project uh, proved that um, communities actually matter. I mean, you always know that it matters, but when you work in all this like uh, media climate that we have in our countries, uh, uh, it's quite cynical in a lot of sense. Like you, editors see things through this like market, uh, whether uh, content has market value or not, whether it will give you more money or not. And things like community building, they are like those of those like nice to have things that you never do in the end because you do some things that you need for profit. So um, it's really Im inspiring to be here with people who see community building not as some kind of nice choice of words, but actual thing and I also want to add that um, I think it's important to build community among journalists um, journalists themselves for example in our case we were all freelancers working alone and then we decided it's much better to be together and uh, we also have uh, like a, a Facebook group of around I think 40 people who are like our we call them interns but in general they are just people who work in media like can it be other writers, uh, graphic designers, photographers who are always there and we, if we have some kind of task that we aren't able to do themselves or want to um, discuss things, we just write down there and there's a lot of people who also want to create kind of new journalism in Lithuania and they are there, our, like a small community there and, it's, and we feel strong, like for example I met Berta, she always was um, thinking that she's a great journalist and now we work together, I mean we've, I, we both have feel, feel more powerful now, so yeah, community is about journalism as well. And your takeaway, who's your new best friend in finding common ground? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 Greg and Maeve, definitely. <laughs> Well handled. Uh, so on that, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to give a, a one shout out and, and a possible resource for the room and um, for my um, esteemed panelists. Uh, the European Journalism Center um, launched um, the Engaged Journalism Accelerator Project on Thursday uh, that the News Integrity Initiative is also supporting. Very similarly, um, this organization will have um, mini grants, uh, coaching um, and mentorship available for European news rooms to try some of these um, strategies out. So um, please check out the Engaged Journalism Accelerator Project by the European Journalism Center. And I want to thank all three of you for your inspiring stories and being brave and innovative um, in this new landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Jenny. Great job.